Welcome back to the Pacific Century, a Hoover Institution podcast on China, America, the Indo-Pacific, and the fate of the 21st century. I'm your host, Misha Oslin, and today I am I'm very happy to be joined by two real experts in the field of Chinese espionage and uh, the effects on uh, the U.S. and and U.S. Uh, economy and technology. Um, we're joined today by Anna Puglisi uh, and Matt Brazil. Anna is the Director of Biotechnology Programs and a Senior Fellow at Georgetown's Center for Security and Emerging Technology. Previously, Anna served as the National Counterintelligence Officer for East Asia. Uh, she played a prominent role in drafting the U.S. National Counterintelligence Strategy, uh, and she developed multidisciplinary efforts to understand global technology development and their impact on U.S. competitiveness and national security. Matt Brazil is a senior analyst with Blue Path Labs, a fellow at the Jamestown Foundation and a former U.S. Army officer and diplomat. He's the co-author of a seminal book, Chinese Communist Espionage and Intelligence Primer, uh, which was published by Naval Institute Press, and is currently working on a new narrative history of Chinese intelligence. So, Anna and Matt, welcome to the Pacific Century. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's a pleasure being here. Uh, great to have you both. And and again, this is an area that is starting to get a lot of attention, uh, goes in, in ups and downs. And I think Americans in many ways are still trying to get their heads around the idea of Chinese espionage. It's, it's a little easier, I think, both in terms of tradition and the starkness of the Cold War to have thought about uh, Russian espionage. Um, but for the decades in which we were thinking about partnering with China and, and trying to be a partner with China and bringing it into the world system, we really didn't focus, despite evidence to the contrary, we really didn't focus on uh, Chinese espionage. Um, Perhaps the latest revelation uh, is a new report that just came out uh, from an outfit called Strider Labs, uh, which looked specifically at the role of China and, and the Chinese intelligence and security services in trying to, uh, in essence, suborn U.S. scientists, uh, those uh, who were born here, as well as those of, of Chinese descent who were working here, uh, at Los Alamos and some of the other national labs. This, of course, follows on uh, other um, uh, revelations of, of espionage and, and, and then questions that get into gray zones, things like China's Thousand Talents program. So um, to start off our conversation, Matt, let me turn to you. I know this is something you, you focus on uh, directly. Uh, first, can you talk to us a little bit about what this Strider report was, and then we can open it up to look more broadly uh, at the question of Chinese espionage and then, and then uh, move over to Anna. Sure. Well, one of the things that confuses a lot of observers about Chinese espionage is um, its varied nature. It's not just going after classified information. Um, it's not even just about stealing big databases to understand uh, all the people who are in the U.S. government and so on, as we saw with the OPM hack. Um, there's a big focus on technology acquisition. And the way that the technology acquisition is pursued is very different than the, uh, the old KGB model of setting up companies to acquire technology and pretend like they're going to take it somewhere else besides uh, Russia and, or China. Uh, it involves a lot of people-to-people -people, uh, exchanges. It involves uh, this uh, uh, amazingly effective uh, Thousand Talents program. Strider report uh, uh, talks about, and it involves um, getting people in China to go out and uh, and bring back technology, as well as encourage uh, people who are uh, not connected with the intelligence community in China, who are uh, ordinary employees uh, who out outside of China in Western and Japanese companies to. Um, stimulate their entrepreneurial instincts and bring technology back to China for their own benefit and for the benefit of the country. So is that is that illegal? By the way, I mean we you know I hate to say it we did the same thing against the British with the uh, textile industry back in the 
the 1780s, and um, that's that's a, a, a tradition. So why should we be worried about it? What 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 are the Chinese doing that's wrong? The thing that, uh, of course, the Thousand Talents program is, uh, I don't know if one could say it's in large part legal. Uh, in significant elements, it's perfectly legal to encourage somebody to go back to China and uh, assist the, the motherland, so to speak, and to recruit uh, foreigners who have no connection, previous connection with China to, uh, to go there. But what becomes illegal is uh, when controlled technology is involved, that is technology that requires an export license to uh, be sent to China from the United States or other countries. And of course, if there's a contractual um, uh, obligation to not share technology that has been part of one's research. And so uh, the, the clandestine part, uh, the signpost for, for um, Illegal activity is usually clandestinity. So, uh, Anna, actually, let me let me turn to you at, at this point before we broaden the conversation. I do want to talk about some of the more traditional uh, methods of Chinese espionage and things that, uh, uh, Matt, you covered so extensively in your book, which was co-written by, by Peter Mattis with you. I'm going to come back to that. But, Anna, so you're working, uh, you, you worked in government for uh, a number of decades and uh, at the FBI and uh, you, you've worked on counterintelligence. Um, how serious, uh, based on what you heard Matt talk about, obviously what you know, how serious is what the Chinese are doing in terms of U.S. competitiveness, in terms of trade secrets, what we would call intellectual property broadly, uh, and therefore the U.S.'s position, traditional position of being the world's leading tech power? Are, are, or should we worry about it or is this just what happens? Right. I think I'm going to pull on that thread of um, like, how is this different, right? Um, it's different in a number of ways because I think it's the scale and scope of what we're seeing happening. Um, and it's the kinds of places that we're seeing targeted as well. Um, I think you, know, you mentioned the Cold War, and, and that was a very different, um, you know, focus. Uh, you know, folks have heard me talk about, okay, well, you know, our system is not set up to counter uh, a nation state or others that are targeting earlier in the development cycle, because um, that kind of activity really undermines um, scientific norms. Right. Our system set up to fight, you know, in, in the in the past, like during the Cold War, we're looking at intelligence officers, we're looking at um, military end use, and we're looking at things that are narrowly defined as illegal, um, which if we look at our economic espionage statutes, they are pretty narrowly defined. Um, what we're seeing a lot more, though, are... Um, Things that are in the gray area, right? Things that you know you bring up a thousand talents, and you know we want to encourage collaborations, um, but that lack of transparency and reciprocity um, when individuals are signing contracts that where they're told that um, they're not to tell anyone that what they're doing, or um, their uh, their unfair collaborations as far as um, you know taking information that you know belongs to a U.S. academic institution and either starting businesses or, or using that uh, to untoward purposes. Um, and that's, that's kind of really the, the, the difference in that. And so when you, you look at that, um, especially as China has become more capable, it's the, the question of you know, working with their own ideas and working with ours. I know that the, um, uh, the question of intellectual property, it's an easier, maybe in some ways easier one for, for people to get their heads around and the, the Commission on Intellectual Property Theft, which was a government commission, um, uh, estimated a few years ago that the U.S. loses between something like 250, and I know the upper end was $600 billion a year in intellectual property theft. And this is all across the, um, uh, the spectrum, but a, a great deal of it, uh, though they didn't specify a great deal of it, goes uh, to China. In in your work, uh, Anna, I mean, are you able, or, or we more broadly as a society, able specifically to identify the harm that's done, right? So there's sort of a moral harm, right? The things that you were talking about, we don't like the lack of transparency, they may break contracts, they don't, you know, they're not open, so on and so forth. Um, but what's the actual real harm done? So the IP Commission says $600 billion, it's an economic number. 
uh, are have we lost the lead in certain technologies because of this? Are we at danger of not being able to uh, to maintain a lead uh, in other technologies where where we have invested? What what is it that we should really be focusing on? Yeah, um, having being able to quantify that loss, right? Because we get a lot of questions: as how big or how bad is this? And um, you know, can you put a number on it? Can you can you quantify it? Um, one of the challenges with doing that is that um, a lot of times it, it are things that before they're commercialized, uh, before they're actually monetized. So we're we're looking early in the development cycle. So we're looking at basic research. We're looking at ideas. Um, although there are cases, um, and I think um, the solar panels, that's one example of, you know, companies going out of business or people, you know, 500 people losing their jobs. Um, so these have really real world um, implications. And it's also, um, it's the Delta. It's not only, okay, that idea today, but it's what industries and what businesses are not going to happen, right? Because the ideas and the work that we've invested in are now no longer benefiting U.S. universities or U.S. companies, um, but are, are, are being transferred in um, unfair ways. And um, the, uh, in essence, what we see in a lot of cases, and certainly in the public case, is that, you know, to, to make it a more political statement, the U.S. taxpayer is subsidizing uh, China, the, the government, and, and even companies. I mean, first, you have a civil military fusion in China in which all technologies that are, are brought in, with, you know, civil, civilian technologies are designed to uh, um, ultimately be of use in the military. Uh, there was a report a number of years ago uh, from the Pentagon that essentially stated that every single weapon system uh, in production or under development had been compromised to some degree or another by the Chinese. And so suddenly you have Chinese uh, stealth jets that look like our stealth jets and drones that look like our drones and so on. So we're actually you know, subsidizing the growth of the Chinese military. But but I, I'm i wondering, Anna, if you can uh, tell us a little bit more about what are the key areas that the Chinese are focusing on and therefore what we need to be worried about. And then I want to I want to go back to Matt to try to broaden this a little bit about more general uh, counterintelligence and, you know, sort of round robins with you guys. But but first, what what are the areas? You mentioned solar, and we know the U.S. solar um, industry uh, was was largely overtaken by Chinese and um, by Chinese companies. So what are the areas? Is it quantum? Is it AI? Is it machine learning, uh, voice facial recognition? Where are they benefiting the most from this type of uh, espionage that we're talking about? Sure. Um, so, yeah, I'd like to make back up just a little bit, because um, you make some really great points about the U.S. taxpayer and, you know, are we funding, um, what are we funding for the future? Because that's really, really what's at stake. Um, and the whole idea of, um, you can talk a little bit about competition and, and what what kind of, you know, investments do we need to make today that are going to have those impacts 5, 10, 15 years down the road that drive um competition and drive industries of the future. Um, but what it really comes back to is we're dealing with an entirely different system. And, and that's really what the challenge is because, you know, our academics, our businesses enter into agreements um, with assumptions about how those systems going to work, how those collaborations or those business deals are going to work. Um, and, you know, what we see uh, China doing is acting in a very, very different way. Right. So essentially uh, setting goals, setting strategies, which, you know, you, you have to commend them. They, they have uh, you know, really do take a long view and put political capital and investment over time, which for a lot of these industries really make a big difference. Um, but what that does then is it really kind of tilts the playing field. Right. So our academics and our, our businesses are individuals up against the nation state as opposed to um competing one-on-one -on -one with either a, another uh, academic or company. Um, but the things that, you know, I, I often tell folks, we should listen to what China tells us. And the kinds of things that they're emphasizing is um, really, uh, you know, wanting to lead in biotech. They talk about uh, not only being a biotech power, but being a biotech superpower. Um, and it's a lot of the usual things. It's um, also uh, advanced materials, uh, of course, you know, 
lots of investments in AI. Uh, but it's also those things that are key enabling technologies. And I think, you know, we focus so much on, okay, what is cutting edge as opposed to what is that infrastructure, whether it be big science facilities, uh, investment in education, or the key enabling um, kind of more low tech, even manufacturing facilities that are going to really enable those industries. So let me, um, uh, I mean, we could keep going on about, there's a lot of really interesting questions, but I, I, I want to see if we can broaden it a little bit and bring in the expertise of, of both of you uh, on the, the broader question of, of uh, espionage. So Matt, your 2019 book, uh, which I, I referenced Chinese communist espionage, um, uh, again, really, it's it's a it's a it's a primer for anyone who wants to learn about the history of it. It's not just hey, what's happened in the past six months as of 2019. It, it goes back uh, to the beginnings of the PRC and before that, and the CCP, and that's why you call it communist um, espionage. And it's an, an an amazing list of um, both cases that most Americans, I venture, don't. Uh, know about as well as insights. So, for the, for example, the the fact that um, the Chinese uh, started so late in the human espionage game that they actually became better at technical espionage um, because they didn't have the access that that so many uh, uh, you know that, that the Russians, for example, had or others. So, um, let me ask you a very broad question: How successful are the Chinese? Overall, not just in this tech sphere, at espionage in the United States, um, where where are they focused? How good are they at penetrating? Uh, of course, we've talked about business. How good are they at penetrating um, federal government, uh, local government, um, uh, civil society groups that they don't like? I mean, what 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 is? Can you pull the curtain back for us a little bit? Sure, I, I would start by referencing um, something that I observed in. 1989 and 1990, when I was working in the Office of Export Enforcement at Commerce, my uh, late boss, uh, Robert W. Rice, led a, led a delegation to Hungary, Poland, and Czechoslovakia. And he interviewed scientists who had been working on projects that required control technology that was diverted, um, stolen, or however, uh, to the behind the Iron Curtain. And he discovered that they all had the same answer, and that was that your export controls are a pain in the rear. They <laughs> caused us to have to pay a lot more for everything we needed. They caused us to uh, have to wait a long time. And when it came to spare parts, uh, it was sometimes impossible to get them. Um, and so that was a bit of a surprise because of all the criticism about uh, export controls. And it showed that until the archives are open in Beijing, so Beijing, if you're listening, open up those archives. They are. They are. Don't worry. <laughs> open up those archives. Um, we won't really know the full extent of, um, of their uh, success until their archives are opened. Um, but the challenge, um, as Anna just talked about, of an entirely different system leading an assault uh, a worldwide uh, espionage and influence offensive uh, on not only the United States, but uh, allied countries is uh, a formidable one. And, and I think that uh, one reason why they're doing everything they're doing now, which is even more uh, intense than it was a decade ago, is because the leadership of the party has concluded that the current international system must change. Uh, if they are to realize the potential that they wish to realize, not only in um, uh, gaining control over Taiwan, in pursuing their own uh, Monroe Doctrine, so to speak, of, um, of, of uh, having primary influence in Asia and being able to uh, uh, control the narrative about China uh, in the rest of the world. And so um, uh, they... They use uh, they use in a better way, in a more efficient way, I think. Um, although there are problems here and there, um, they use some of the same techniques that we've used in the past. They have uh, uh, the book that's coming out uh, this week by Alex Josky, um, called "Spies and Lies," is uh, is quite something. It uh, 
catalogs uh, 13 different cases or, or themes of, um, of how uh, Ministry of State Security uses front organizations um, to achieve its various ends, not only uh, to steal technology and to uh, acquire secrets and meet the right people, uh, government secrets, but also to exert influence to, to uh, get people to, um, to adopt Beijing's line about the way the world is. Actually, could you, could you take a second to, um, since you've uh, worked on this so much, uh, from the Chinese angle and the Chinese perspective, and of course you are a, a Mandarin speaker and uh, have had years of, of looking at the documents, could you outline for us just briefly what the Chinese uh, intelligence apparatus looks like, their, their intelligence community? You mentioned United Front, there's Ministry of State Security, um, there's, there's military uh, intelligence. Can you uh, just, you know, give us a 101 on what parts uh, work uh, to to these ends and how they work together against the United States? Yeah, the extent to which they work together is an open question and a very interesting one. Um, it, it's uncertain whether these different agencies have defined turf or whether they are competing with each other because in the past, um, there have been uh, uh, observations of the same target being hit by more than one agency. But to, to give a quick overview, the Ministry of State Security is uh, under the State Council, although it really is uh, more like a party organization. Um, and it's a large ministry. It has uh, probably 100,000 people wow. working for it. Um, and it's the primary civilian intelligence agency. So then you have under the party, you have itself uh, party departments, you have the United Front Work Department, which is probably the most important here. And uh, the UFWD has a history of working with uh, Chinese communist intelligence and vice versa. That goes all the way back to the revolution, which I won't bore you with all that history. Um, but then on the military side, after the 2015 reorganization, of, of the military and uh, also more quietly of the intelligence community. You have uh, the strategic support force, which is like NSA um, to make a rough comparison. And you have the uh, intelligence bureau of the general staff, which uh, was previously known as 2PLA, the second department of the PLA. And exactly what each of them are doing, of course, is um, um, picture is not complete, but it seems logical that the military would be going after military secrets and the MSS would be going after some of those too, um, because they have an extensive uh, effort and, and also uh, uh, to, to run influence operations with the United Front Work Department and to, uh, to steal technology that's useful to Chinese industry. Uh, that gets into a, an entirely different area that Anna is very familiar with because of the book that she co-wrote. Um, and she should probably describe that. Oh, that was a great T.O. <laughs> oh, this, I, I love when I love when one guest tees it up for another guest. So Anna, no, thank you. Take it away. And then, and then I want to ask you um, more specifically about from your position, having been in the U.S. government about Chinese success uh, you know, the, the counterintelligence angle that you took, their success in penetrating. But but please pick up from, from Matt's cue. Way to go, Matt. Sure. Yeah. So actually, that was a, that was a great handoff um, because uh, our first book, we actually called Chinese Industrial, Industrial Espionage, but we really wanted to call it Beyond um, Espionage because I think that's really important to get a handle on that. You know, how we see China targeting our technology is, is very different. Um, they use, and that's not not all of it. There, there is a you know role for the intelligence communities, but but by and large, what <clears throat> I spent a lot of time focusing on is what we call our non traditional collectors, and so it's the experts that are working on these programs um, that are targeting the technology, and that makes it really hard, right? Because you're not looking um, at intelligence officers per se. These are uh, you know, experts that have great bona fides. Um, it's easier to, for them to talk to other experts. 
Um, and you see these tech acquisition programs hard baked into the S&T development programs. And that, I think, is something that also really distinguishes what China does. We look at their medium to long term plan for S&T development. We look at their strategic emerging industries programs. Um, they talk about exploiting collaborations. They talk about using um, universities to fill strategic gaps. Um, and some of the cases uh, that um, that Matt is very familiar with, as well as um, you know that we've explored, even re related to agriculture. I mean, you have the Ministry of Agriculture running tech acquisition programs, so it's a very, very different way in a lot of ways. That um, you know, it's, it's it's a much more holistic approach to how they're targeting um, technology. So, if we zoom out a little bit, and your work on the, the National Counterintelligence Strategy as the National Counterintelligence Officer, mm -hmm. um, how, how? Well, first, is that was that more government focused uh, to the degree? Of, I understand there's a lot you can't talk about, but to the degree you can talk about it, is that more government focused, meaning counterintelligence, CI, and uh, to protect government secrets, government workers, government agencies, or was it more? Um, you know, was it broader on American society? Uh, and then secondly, um, to the extent that it's public, what were your assessments? How good were they or how pervasive were they? What, what is it that Americans need to know about this penetration of society? Um, well, I'm going to take a step back and talk a little bit about um, one of the things that we really tried to, or that I focused on, um, is telling these stories, right? And and really highlighting how different these systems are. And that's that's really key. Um, and, uh, you know, Matt talked a lot about the influence of the United Front Work Department. Um, and uh, it, it comes across, across of academia, we're looking at state and local. Um, and you know, in my time at the National Counterintelligence Security Center, um, we actually uh, wanted to take an approach that, okay, we have to look at this differently as a society, right? Because our systems are different. Our system's not set up uh, to counter uh, things that are, are targeting at universities, things that are targeted at state and local governments, things that are targeted at um, uh, critical infrastructure, uh, and really kind of raising the awareness of um, the American public uh, that, you know, this is the approach and a very different approach that uh, the Chinese government and entities take towards targeting technology. And also, you know, you know, in the past, we were involved in a strategic rivalry. Um, and one of the challenges of this rivalry is China masks key parts of it and really tries to control the message. So most people don't realize we're in this rivalry. Um, and so until it's, until they've either, they run into trouble and, and we hear this a lot with you know, different companies or even academics um, that, you know, who they think they're dealing with isn't who they are or um, you know, they lose key technologies um, and then, you know, kind of uncover or unpack the true uh, you know, nature of, of, of how they've been targeted. Um, and so, so that, 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 that's actually, you know, been in, you know, kind of the drumbeat that I, I have is we really need to, um, to realize that, you know, this is, we need, we need a different system in order. We, 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 we have to rethink how we um, protect us competitiveness and how we protect uh, my former boss calls it the uh, new geopolitical battle space, which is commerce and academia. We must up our game. We do. Actually, we must do more than just up our game. Right. We so we have this this view, you know, again of of espionage in the shadows and you know individuals. And you're talking about this much more holistic approach. And you've talked a couple of times about about systems um, on a scale from one to ten. Then ten being the worst for us and one being the best for us, Anna. Um, how successful are the Chinese in, in penetrating the areas that they want to penetrate? And that leads to another question, which is, do we know all the areas that we want that they want to penetrate? Meaning we can see certain things. So maybe they're only 10% successful because we've somehow defended 90, but those 10% we look at as 100%, right? That's everything we know. We know they're there. So first, how successful are they and how much 
as as uh, former Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld used to say, what are the unknown unknowns that we deal with? Uh, I will say, um, so I'm, I'm going to talk mainly in uh, the areas that I'm most familiar with, which is the tech and, ac and academia um, and commerce. And I think China has been very successful. I mean, across a whole wide range of technology areas, that's you know, the cases that we have um, don't even tell the whole story, although they tell quite a few stories. And so, um, and again, it gets at that point of, you know, our system isn't geared towards protecting basic research or, to be, or um, geared towards sharing basic research. It, exactly. But that's, you know, it's built on trust of, you know, collaborations and the global norms of, of how that, uh, how those endeavors are, are entered into. Um, and so, you have a nation state that is coming at our seams, really, between FI, CI, and law enforcement, and that that creates a lot of challenges. So I'm I'm going to say you're you're basically telling us it's an eight plus, maybe a nine. Who knows? Could be edging towards. <laughs> I think we, what we see is just the tip of the iceberg. Let's just put it that way. Yeah. Oh wow! I think so. Really? The the the. Well, that's. I mean, that is shocking. So the tip of the iceberg, Matt. Um, one thing that, that, you know, we like numbers, we like focusing on numbers and you'll see these numbers, right? There's 25,000 Chinese spies in the U S but as Anna and you have been talking about the way we think about what, it, who is a quote unquote spy or not a spy is different, you know, is someone who works, uh, in a lab and, you know, is part of thousand talents and maybe even disclose that. Uh, but is bringing over sensitive information. Is are they a spy? How many Chinese spies, to be very crude about it, are there in the U.S.? But then talk to us more about how we understand this from a from a human level. Well, I I would point to the uh, the case of Charles Lieber. Yes, formerly of the chemistry department at Harvard University. Um, Doctor Lieber. Uh, something that wasn't discussed very much in the press was that Doctor Lieber was working on nanowire technology, among other things, which can be used to connect a computer to your body, uh, among other things. Uh, now you got a whole different set of things you got me worried about, but let's, <laughs> let's just stick with the espionage for now. Yeah, well, he, the, the, the thing I wanted to point out about that is that Thousand Talents um, was used to fund a very lucrative effort uh, by the Wuhan University of Technology to bring Dr. Lieber over uh, and in essence, hand over a bunch of military related technology, the cutting edge stuff. And he knew that he knew what he was giving to them. It wasn't like he didn't understand it. It's, it seems that he knew fairly well what he was doing, although he was not a spy and he made uh, lots of mistakes. He was not trained uh, at all. And, and that's an, another hallmark of the Chinese system. So a lot of their officers are well-trained. They're, they're um, fluent in foreign languages. Uh, they, they know what they're supposed to do. Uh, and some of their officers, it seems, are less well-trained. The case of Christine Fang, for example, Fang Fang, in the San Francisco Bay Area, was being handled uh, doing influence work by an MSS officer out of the consulate in San Francisco. And they met in public. Why on earth would you do that if you're an MSS officer? Meet a source in public where the FBI can take pictures. And to remind people, um, Fong Fong was accused of having a personal relationship with Representative Eric Swalwell, right, who sits on the Intelligence Committee mm -hmm. in Congress. So yeah, I, I understand that there was never, um, of course, there's there's the sexy picture of Swalwell and, and Christine Fong, um, uh, but it I haven't heard any actual evidence that there was a relationship there. There were, there was apparently uh, a couple relationships in another part of the country with um, up and coming politicians that she had. That she had. Yeah. Okay. Okay. It's good to know. Good to clarify. Yeah. So, but how many how many spies are there? Um, <clears throat> again, I think uh, Beijing has to open up its archives before we'll really know the answer to that. But the important part for what do we do next is to recognize that we are outgunned right now in the counterintelligence sphere uh, and how many FBI agents who are responsible for the face-to-face -face work of counter espionage speak the language? How many of them know anything about the culture and how you would uh, 
cultivate or not cultivate a confidential source, whether they're uh, Chinese American or whether they are uh, an immigrant or whatever, um, we just don't have enough resources there. And if you look at our military and our foreign service, they train people before they send them off to do China related tasks. They send them to language school. They send them to uh, get a one year uh, master's in East Asian studies. But our law enforcement doesn't do that. And our corporations don't do that either. Uh, people who do corporate security work, it's rare for them to have any training to understand how Chinese espionage works and understand Chinese society and the language. So this is where we really need to up our game. So Anna, can you can you pick up on that, having uh, sat on the inside for a long time and again worked on a, a counterintelligence strategy? And, and I understand, you know, you've, you've focused most on academia and tech, but uh, obviously you have a, have a broad view. Um, where are we really in danger or, or is it across the board? Is it, you know, in, in um, the, the lack of, of rigorous counterintelligence within government? Is it, is it the, the leading tech companies? Is it our research labs? Uh, meaning if uh, Matt's saying we, we have to up our game, there's a lot we have to do. What is it you would say we specifically need to do and how do we do it? Yes. Uh, so, yeah, I would say we definitely, I agree with Matt, we have to up our game. Um, and I think it's, thinking at it, of it strategically um, and what the end game is, right? And what, what, what do we really want to protect? What do we want to, um, what do we want that to look like? Because we don't want to, we don't want to break the system. Um, we want to uh, keep, and, you know, we, we want to have an open society. We want to keep those collaborations going. And it's just thinking holistically, how do we um, double down on on that as well and but then also protect the things we need to protect um and i think that that's going to take a lot of different parts working together um i do agree with matt we do need um you know folks that that focus on language and understanding um but we also have to understand that you know we um we really do i think the students and researchers of Chinese descent a disservice who hear if we don't call out the differences in our systems. Um, and I think it's really hard for Westerners to understand the kind of pressure um, that the Chinese can, government can bring to bear on those researchers and students. And um, so it's not so, you know, we get the question all the time of, oh, well, how many Chinese spies are here? And, um, you know, and there's a, 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 a kind of ethnic profiling kind of undercurrent to that, that I, I find, you know, very, uh, very dangerous. I've said that there's no place for that in the U S because we have, you know, we are a, a nation of immigrants, um, but we do them a disservice by not acknowledging um, the pressure that the Chinese government puts on them. And also the, the differences in the laws. I mean, these are in national security law um, and others that, you know, openly state that they, you know, are, can compel their citizens, can compel their businesses um, to work with them. And we do see a large crackdown on civil society um, under Xi Jinping. And so that's something that I think that we need to talk about more. So it's a, it's a great point. I mean, we often think, you know, we can do something government to government, you know, in terms of trying to change um, policies or, or block or, or whatever it is that we want to achieve. And yet, the uh, your point about the pressure being put on researchers, students, um, the watching of students through groups like the Chinese Association of Students and Scholars, um, these make it extremely difficult mm -hmm. uh, to find those sort of counter pressure points. I guess is 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 what I would is what I would say. Um, so in you know to to sort of move us towards wrapping up, then what what encourages you both about what we're doing now uh, in, in the face of Chinese pervasive espionage, or is there nothing that encourages you? Are we getting it right? And, and I think it's important to have the context of understanding that our overall government goal was to work with China, to create a strategic partner, to bring it into these, these research and cultural and political and economic systems, because we 
made a, a bet that that was the best way to help China develop peacefully and, and prosperously and become a, a beneficial part of the, the world system. Now we're having a reassessment of that. So we, we've started late. We've started behind in some ways. Uh, we didn't start off with suspicion. We started off with hope. I think in many ways we're now at suspicion. So given that and, and the change that we've seen over you know, the past half decade or so, is there anything that encourages you beyond just our talking about it um, to both of you? I'd start off by saying, <clears throat> first of all, that the Communist Party has always correctly viewed its society as being full of enemies. And so this is a good thing for us because we can use that uh, in our own system where we are, as Anne points out, a country of immigrants, where we have a system that recognizes civil liberties, uh, where we attempt anyway to avoid allowing racism and xenophobia to uh, steer our policy. Um, we are a, a, an ideal system to tackle that problem. And I would point out that, by the way, we're Americans, we solve problems, we recognize problems, we solve them, and we maintain a positive attitude if only we can keep our country together. That's another small problem. Um, but I, I see a lot of hope in the future because I believe that there is a, a dawning recognition of the extent of this problem and once we get our act together and we up our game, I think we will do well. Anna, do you, do you agree with that? Or, or what would you add? I do. I am encouraged. I'm encouraged because um, as you, you know, you early, you stated, you know, there was that hope. Um, but I think we have to deal with the China we have, not the China we wanted. Um, and part of that is going to be you know, the first step is we're talking about it. We're telling those stories, right? And we're acknowledging, um, you know, the behavior. It's not that that is going on that is, um, you know, not acceptable. And um, and we're also, you know, we have to recognize there are things that we can do to fix ourselves. And so I think chips and science is a first first step um, mm -hmm. in that, you know, chips we need to yeah. chips and science acts. So we need to really um, remember that technology is a national asset. And, you know, it is underpins our foreign policy and the way, you know, our freedom of, of action. Um, and we need to work together. I think that will be key, different facets of, of society, whether it be academia with government and commercial um, entities to really um, uh, be a part of that competition. Well, there's, a, I mean, that raises a very interesting question about the um, the willingness of the commercial entities to to protect their own secrets. I mean, how much they see themselves as global companies versus American companies. Mm -hmm. um, I, I actually, since we're running a little bit low on time, and I know Matt actually has to be running soon, I don't want to get into that yet. But I do want to ask you guys a final question, which is a more cultural question. Uh, and it goes back, I think, a little bit to where I started, which was um, we were very aware um, socially, culturally, of the Soviet threat in the Cold War, right? And, and it, it engendered thousands upon thousands of books and novels and movies and discussions and treatments. Um, and, you know, from James Bond to, uh, to everything, you know, about, about the, the, the bad Soviets. Yes, I'm aware James Bond's British, but you, you take my point. Um, and yet we see so little of that uh, in relation to China, despite what you guys have talked about, the pervasiveness of this in our universities and our, our corporations, and of course, the, the whole raft of, of, um, of direct sort of espionage cases that, uh, that Matt talks about uh, in, in his book, you know, uh, FBI, CIA officers that, you know, turned and, and offered uh, information to the Chinese. Um, why do you think that that is? Why do you guys think that is? And and it, will it change? Because it, it certainly creates in the public mind a more adversarial relationship to some degree. And yet, if you listen to our government leaders, we're in uh, at, at best competitive and at worst an adversarial relationship. So why is it that you think we just haven't sort of made this part of the way we view the world? That the Chinese are spying, they're spying all across the board, they're pervasive, they're successful, 
And we really need to uh, counter it. And one of the ways you do that as a culture is, you know, you do it fictionally, you, you bring up these questions and then you make stories out of them. One problem is uh, simple cultural unfamiliarity. Any book publisher that wants to sell books, for example, um, Jan Wong, the uh, former correspondent in China of the Toronto Globe and Mail faced this problem when she wrote her books. You can't put too many Chinese names on the page because it's going to confuse the reader. Mm. Uh, and so we need, uh, again, to up our game, not only in law enforcement, but also in society. Um, there needs to be more education about China, more realization that China is uh, an extremely important country, uh, particularly to the future of the United States. And if we can develop more of that cultural familiarity, then there'll be more a more receptive audience for information about China, including fiction. Anna, what would you say? I, I think I'm going to double down on, um, I think we, we really need to talk about how different the systems are, really. And at the end of the day, it's which, which view of the world do you want, right? What do you want? Um, it, you know, the, or what, how do you, what system do you want to be um, the global system? And, you know, we need to kind of double down on those values and, and talk about them. Well, I think it's a great, it's a great point, um, in part, again, historically, because what we told ourselves is that over time and gradually the Chinese system would become more like our system, not, you know, wouldn't be Peoria, you know, and, and right. democratic voting, but it would look more like us. You'd have mm -hmm. a middle class that demanded political uh, power uh, and the like, and that hasn't happened. So in part, we, uh, you know, to, to draw out your point, which I think is a really important one, um, is is that we told ourselves that those systems would become uh, mm -hmm. more alike. And then secondly, um, it's also a great point to bring up Anna right now because uh, in a week or so, we're heading into the 20th Party Congress where I think it'll put the final nail in the coffin of thinking that this system, i.e. the Chinese system, was going to change. You're going to have Xi Jinping appointed to a third term uh, as party leader. Um, he talks constantly about the great struggle that the party is in uh, and that China is in against the world. Um, we have, you know, documents and evidence going all the way back, you know, a decade ago to the infamous document number nine that said, do not become like the West, do not engage in liberalism, do not engage in democracy. Um, so your point about systems, I think, is, is critical in that. And that gets us to that much broader meta question of, of, of values and of an understanding, as you put it, which system do you want to be dominant in the world? Um, well, this has been a, a great, uh, a great conversation. You know, obviously people are out there saying, yeah, you know, tell me more about the spies. Tell me more about what was stolen. And of course, it's hard to talk about this. A lot of it remains classified. A lot of it uh, is, is hard to um uh, to to contextualize for those who don't have this you know specific knowledge of what is being passed you know Matt mentioned Lieber and the stuff he was working on but I think both of you gave a really great overview of a, of an issue that is just going to be um, further uh, at the at the top of the concern of both policymakers and the public so Anna Puglisi uh, from Georgetown's uh, Center for uh, Security and Emerging Technology and Matt Brazil. Uh, from Blue Path Labs. Uh, thanks so much for joining me on the Pacific Century. Thank you. Thank you. So for the Pacific Century, this is Misha Oslin uh, telling you to watch your back and we will be with you again uh, in a couple weeks. Bye-bye. This podcast is a production of the Hoover Institution, where we advance ideas that define a free society and improve the human condition. For more information about our work or to listen to more of our podcast or watch our videos, please visit hoover.org.